Oh, no, it's it's a, like a magical camera. Oh. So I'm not going to, <laughs> it finds you. I'm not going to um, belabor the point. I just will introduce very quickly the names of our speakers. Um, today we have Yevgeny Roshin um, and a fuller, uh, um, a fuller introduction will be forthcoming in a few minutes by another participant in the panel uh, who is Anton Chudikov, one of the postdoctoral fellows here at Harriman Institute and a political scientist. Um, and virtually up there on the screen, you can see Kasia Kashmarska, and she um, will be speaking to us um, from home. But with our our excellent technology, I think um, I think it should be I think it should go over pretty well. So uh, the format is just that we'll have um, the speaker speak a little bit, and then we'll have question and answer and um, more of a conversation. But I would just say that you know. Um, People on the, some people on the panel have lived this question themselves, um, being from Russia. So that adds a, a little bit um, of an immediacy, I think, to the discussion today, which um, which you know makes it a little bit even um, more uh, more of a difficult um, and and sad topic. But I'm okay. And now I would like to introduce Anton Shirdikov, and he will say a few words about the genesis of the panel. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I am Anton Shirikov, a postdoc here at the Herman Institute. I, I work on Russian politics, Russian propaganda. Um, so this panel, uh, at some point, we were thinking about um, looking at what's going on with the invasion um, in, in Russia and outside of Russia from the perspective of people who, who studied Russia, social scientists who did it. Um, and you might think, well, what academic freedom you can have in an authoritarian regime? Um, but we know that there was a fairly strong community of scientists and academics in the Soviet Union. And uh, in the past 20 years, or even 30 years, um, that there's been growing a fairly strong community of social scientists. Um, and this community was also increasingly integrated with social scientists in the West who studied Russian. Uh, so we, at some point, we decided that uh, since a lot of people are living in Russia, um, but a lot of people are staying in Russia, and are still continuing um, doing the work, uh, doing the research, we thought it would be important to discuss this topic and uh, also bring in the perspectives of, of people who, again, both are living and staying. And uh, in Yevgeny's talk today, we will hear about that as well. And, and in Tess's, um, we, will, we will also look at the broader picture. So um, let me just introduce um, Pierce now. Um, Yevgeny Roshin is here with me. He received his PhD from the University of U.S. Kula in, in Finland in 2009, um, and he was uh, uh, an Academy, Academy of Finland postdoctoral researcher. Um, and uh, for the past uh, seven years, or rather until 2022, he had been the head of the School of Faculty of International Relations and Politics at RENEPA, St. Petersburg, and he resigned from his position at RENEPA in March 20, uh, 2022 in protest of the war and in protest of uh, the position that Russian academics or Russian rectors expressed in support of the war. His research interests include the studies of concepts in political and international theory, uh, republicanism, and academic freedom. Uh, he is the author of Friendship Among Nations, History of a Concept, uh, published by Manchester University Press, and of a variety of articles in uh, European Journal of International Relations, European International Studies, and various other journals. And um, he's also the author of various comments and op-eds on Russian international politics. And our second speaker on Zoom, joining us from Edinburgh, is uh, Kaisia Kaczmarska, uh, who's a lecturer in politics and international relations in the School of Social and Political Science, University of Edinburgh. She researches the social political context and their impact on knowledge production, and specifically the opportunities for and challenges to academic freedom, uh, especially in Russia and the post-Soviet region more broadly. She is the author of Making Global Knowledge in Local Contexts, The Politics of International Relations and Policy Advice in Russia. Um, and she studies grassroots initiatives promoting knowledge about academic freedom. Um, she was um, a Marie Skudowska Curie Fellow at St. Petersburg State University and Everest West University. Uh, she's also a member of the Academic Freedom Committee of the International Studies Association. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna pass the floor to Evgeny. Um, so we will have two uh, approximately 15 minutes or so talks, and then we'll move on to questions. 
right yeah uh, hi everyone uh it's a privilege to be here and uh thank you all for coming uh i'm also delighted to be on a panel with anton who i met uh, exactly 20 years ago in uh, uh, St. Petersburg when we both started a master program at the European University of St. Petersburg. And also with uh, Kasia uh, Kaczmarska, who was visiting me at the uh, European University where we had some good experiences uh, together. Um, today I wanted to give a first reading of uh, my uh, paper on uh, self-censorship in Russian academia. This is a research project that I started uh, with uh, a colleague of mine before the war, and then the war uh, had to uh, interrupt uh, more or less every main uh, that was going on in the Russian universities. And then they resumed uh, a few months uh, into the war. So this paper is about uh, uh, the idea of freedom, and what it means uh, when it comes to academic freedom. I'll start with uh, a few words uh, about theory. Academic freedom literature on uh, higher education uh, in semi-free countries uh, tends to focus uh, too much on uh, uh, persecution of individual academics. This is my uh, first observation. This focus has been influenced uh, by uh, a sort of uh, traditional uh, liberal theory, which understood freedom as non-interference. So, while I believe this focus is uh, tremendously important, uh, I also think that uh, a more significant problem for academic freedom is a ubiquitous uh, practice of uh, self-censorship. This problem is more difficult to conceptualize uh, from the standpoint of uh, traditional liberal theory because, because of its uh, foundational assumptions uh, uh, about an external agency that interferes uh, with one's uh, liberty. When it comes to self-censorship, uh, an individual embarks on this practice by herself, uh, by her own will. So the question I ask in my research is why academics subject themselves uh, to self-censorship despite the existence of uh, uh, legal instruments that allegedly protect academic freedom? The answer that I want to offer is uh, derived from a neo Roman, or sometimes it is called Republican theory of freedom, most notably uh, formulated by Quentin Skinner and uh, Philip uh, Pettit. And I believe uh, this kind of theory could be utilized to expand the discussion of uh, academic freedom in general. Uh, so this theory understands uh, freedom as freedom from domination or freedom as the absence of uh, dependence. Should there be an engine that enjoys uh, unchecked power to interfere with your life or to enjoy an alien control as uh, Philip Pettit would call it, uh, uh, over your life, then it is this fact alone, rather than the fact of interference, that makes you unfree. And as an unfree person, you will fail to constrain your behavior in a way that will not upset uh, that agent holds this uh, dominated position. Another claim that uh, this theory makes uh, is that you can only be free in a free republic. So what is critical is that you should be aware of your status and opportunities to participate in the governance structures. So this is what really makes you a free uh, subject. I then use these uh, claims as a sort of uh, interpretive uh, frame for the case of Russian academia, uh, when I get to explore the factors that contribute to the production of uh, self-censorship. Now, a few words about uh, the research uh, uh, I did with my uh, colleague. Uh, we decided to collect uh, uh, interviews, in-depth interviews, uh, which uh, we did um, uh, with 23 academics uh, across Russia, uh, from Kaliningrad to uh, Vladivostok. Uh, we interviewed people at different career stages and of uh, different genders. So, 
And we asked our interviewees uh, how they see the mission of uh, academia and its standing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its own organization, uh, students, and external powers. So what are the main findings uh, that we have in this research? So the very first finding that we discovered was uh, how important freedom and freedom of speech are to our interviewees. Most of them connected the mission of academia and their being in a classroom with an importance of having voice. So if there is a narrative upon academic uh, vacation, then voice seems to be an integral part of uh, uh, that narrative. This starting observation was important to rule out two arguments. One that freedom uh, is not important or not part of the institutions that are founded by the state or responsible to the state. And the other one that faculty are mere employees uh, on a contract uh, who should just focus on executing their work functions. No, freedom does seem to matter. Another foundation observation about most interviews in, uh, uh, in this research is that most of them uh, mentioned self-censorship, even though we decided not to ask about this practice uh, directly. But anyhow, all respondents uh, came up with this idea. Our next task was to reconstruct the factors that may be perceived as endangering one's freedom and the ways faculty see their status uh, within the university in relation to immediate superiors, uh, administration at large, and to possible external powers. So let me talk about this, about external and internal alien control. We ask interviewees about how they see the university standing vis-a-vis -vis the state as represented uh, uh, by its regulators. And here I would like just to mention that Russia is notorious uh, for uh, its uh, standing, oh, sorry, for its uh, uh, regulation. And here, um, I would like to show my slides and I wonder if uh, they are wrong. Sorry, I didn't check. What matters uh, here is uh, the volume, scope, and depth of the regulation and also the style uh, in which the education watchdog undertook quality assurance uh, measures uh, in the recent past, such as the uh, license and uh, accreditation inspections. Uh, uh, on my slides, uh, I just have uh, a couple of photos. So, uh, let's see. Thank you. Can yeah, just, yeah, I, I have no experience with it. Well, okay. Let me help you. <laughs> Here, here's the you put it on this book, maybe it'll grip and the mouse will work. We're very right. advanced here with the technology. I know the mouse pad. Okay, yeah, it's better. I have no yeah. chat GPT here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, no one better. <laughs> so uh, those uh, inspection checks uh, were normally done on uh, a short notice and uh, a university when it was uh, inspected had to prepare copies of more or less all, all documents that uh, it had on file except for financial documents. So this is the example of the volume. This is what we had to prepare for just uh, two undergraduate uh, programs in politics and international relations. If you can go to the next, so please. Yeah, this is the pile and imagine all programs of the universities prepare uh, the same stuff. It would require at least uh, two tracks, uh, you know, to deliver all the documents to the inspection site. Uh, uh, and the problem was that uh, this uh, uh, process was not automated, which produced uh, numerous, numerous errors uh, in documentation. And those technical minor errors uh, could lead to your license being revoked if the watchdog uh, really wanted to revoke the license. Our respondents noted that the constant exposure to possible inspections and subjection to this kind of 
absurdist reporting, trained university administration to submit to any demands from authorities, regardless of the nature of such demands. And such unreflective submissiveness, coupled with uh, the loyalty to administrative hierarchies, amounts to the installation of an ideal system of alien control over academics. As one interviewee uh, ironically noted, <clears throat> inspections are meant to protect rectors from developing a Stockholm syndrome to preclude them from identifying with their faculty. A rector is not an elected president. He's an appointee, and as such, he is not meant to represent faculty opinion. Conversely, he is expected to deliver a party line thinking to the faculty. So the academics uh, uh, seem to uh, see their universities in this perfect state of dependency on an unchecked uh, power of a regulator. When it comes to the external dimension of liberty, we conclude that academic organizations found themselves dependent on the goodwill of external agencies. And moreover, what's important to bear in mind is that universal leadership no longer sees uh, uh, their constituency inside the university. So now let's talk about uh, internal alien control. Self-government so uh, has been seriously uh, constrained or even eliminated uh, uh, at the universities in the recent years. Formally, and according to the law, chairs and deans are still elected, but the nomination could be done by the administration and voting would take place uh, in the university council, that is by senior administrators and faculty members. And this in fact reflects in faculty's perceptions of their standing. Given that the power of chairs uh, and deans is derived from administration, faculty perceive them as sort of cogs in the machine of uh, domination. And as a result, we observe that what I call uh, the reverse representation system. And leaders in such a system do dominate. Our respond respondents uh, told us uh, about cases when these leaders uh, were telling people what they ought and ought not to do. This is nowhere near to the ideal academic republic as a free republic. Ad academics are not ruled by their own will. Some would say this isn't surprising, but the interviewees do not find this normal. Academics talked about the eroded sense of community, of uh, belonging, and lamented about uh, the lack of joint deliberation over the shared values or principles. So that is to say, they do have this ideal of a free republic in their minds. And this becomes clear when interviewees uh, gave us examples uh, of those micro communities uh, formed around uh, uh, specific programs, or when they gave examples of uh, virtues uh, conducted by exceptional chairs and uh, deans uh, who acted as uh, protective shields uh, for their colleagues against the absurdist uh, uh, regulatory activities. Uh, so to sum up, our interviews show academics' awareness of their dependent and precarious status. They are clearly aware of the existence of uh, powers that exercise alien control both within and outside of their organizations. Uh, they are aware that alien control is not exercised by a benign sleeping giant. Uh, in the absence of protective institutions, they perceive it as a threat. The interviews show two dimensions of uh, this threat related to the exercise of voice. One is related to extramural speech, the other to voice in the classroom. Both are seen as sources of imminent danger that requires taking measures to protect oneself, often in the form of uh, preventive self restraint So what kind of danger are we talking about here? Interviewees told us uh, numerous examples of uh, university administration calling them or uh, representatives of secret police uh, getting in touch or eventually people getting fired for what they said publicly, either on social media 
or just in the media. This all should give us a sense uh, that not only this system of domination is all pervasive, but that it is also effective in signaling the risk of being subjected to arbitrary punishment. The same is true of voice in the classroom. Actually, uh, this problem shows academics vulnerable standing vis-a-vis -vis students. Many of them, especially after the war started, practice what I term a minefield approach, meaning that you cannot trust your own students and speak freely because they could and they would write a denunciation about you. And I would now go to the uh, next you quote. Ah, all right, thank you. Yeah, this is a quote uh, from one of their senior academics, uh, uh, which I found very illuminating in this regard. So, this is what he says. But once I realized uh, that this is happening, and he meant students reporting on faculty, I figured that it would be safest to suppose that the classroom is populated by enemies, and you have to behave therein, therein as if you are on a minefield. End of quote. This approach seems to have prevailed after the start of the war, especially with the adoption of new repressive laws. So the atmosphere of distrust is now absolute. All of this forces uh, faculty into this uh, denigrating practice of self-censorship out of concern with self-preservation. But before I finish, I want to identify another rationale that we identified behind this practice. And this is what transpired uh, from some of the interviews. Uh, it is the motivation that I call self-censorship as care. This dimension comprises the value academics ascribe to those uh, micro republics built around the study program or department. People seems to, seem to be willing to constrain their voice if they feel they can inadvertently uh, set up uh, their immediate colleagues uh, with whom they developed this joint undertaking. And I'll finish with the last quote, uh, and uh, I apologize, well, Chase, uh, for its length. Uh, yeah, here. Yeah, it's on. Um, let me read it uh, since it, it is so so long. A professor is not autonomous uh, in their relationship to universe, to university where they have friends and people to whom they owe a moral duty. They care not so much about themselves as about their friends and others with whom they form social bonds. So when it comes to this kind of uh, normal university where there is a community, they realize that if they put themselves at risk by speaking out, they would thereby uh, put in trouble those colleagues who would feel it is their duty to defend their colleague. This is how censorship works. I do not want another person who is my friend and may occupy a more senior position to sacrifice their career and go into trouble defending me. Thus, the university affiliation itself implies the willingness to self-censor. In this context, some academics might feel righteous or heroic having spoken out, whereas others might think of it as betrayal, since they also have thought of speaking out, but contain themselves because of this, because this way they uh, protect the community. And this is where I believe a central problem really is. And with this, I wrap up and give the floor to Antonio Pazza. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, great. Um, you the floor to Cassia now. I think, could you try to share your slides? I think we, uh, we tried it earlier. Do we have to do it from there? Remove this one. No, no, no. It's. Um, oh, okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, we see it. Okay, perfect. 
I will run it as a, I won't run it as a slideshow. I will run it manually because a slideshow actually freezes my computer. I, I hope it's okay. Uh, so let me start. Right, is it okay? Is everything visible? Can, can anyone confirm, please? Yeah, we see it. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much for the invitation to be part of this panel. Um, what I am going to present today is the trajectory and preliminary results of a research project I have been carrying out with the support of the Mellon Foundation and the Scholars at Risk Network. The project has been looking into grassroots resistance to academic freedom violations in Russia. The idea for the project, um, just like in Evgeny's case, uh, really predates the war. But even prior to the war, the de facto protection of academic freedom in, in Russia had been heavily undermined. Hence my idea to focus not on formal protection mechanisms, but on grassroots organizations and their activities. This slide shows data retrieved from the Academic Freedom Index. On the left hand side, you can see that Russia is at the low end of the list of countries respecting academic freedom. The right hand side shows a steady deterioration across all indicators of academic freedom since the year 2000. And my research looked at the following four organizations. Uh, the Free University, also known as the Moscow Free University, which is an online tertiary education platform, a professional association protesting the political uses of history, and I have decided to anonymize it, uh, its name as uncalled for, uncalled for publicity may not be what the organization needs right now, and this uh, present the, this panel is, is streamed live and another is a trade union and again i decided to anonymize realizing that in and of itself my decision is a commentary on academic freedom in and beyond russia uh, finally troitsky variant nauka uh, which is a bi-weekly print and online journal promoting science i will do my best to present my research within the larger context of academic freedom and higher education in russia but let me first tell you about the original project aims. These were very simple, to understand the approaches to academic freedom promotion and learn about the resistance strategies these organizations have been developing. Russia's invasion of Ukraine made it necessary to update those project aims. And against this fundamentally changed backdrop, I decided to document and contextualize these organizations' reaction to war and the war-related policies introduced by the Russian government, in particular the escalating domestic repressions and the severing of academic ties with Russia by the majority of Western states. Let me give you a brief overview of how the four grassroots organizations strive to promote academic freedom prior to the war. Um, the Free Universities Manifesto declared the enjoyment of academic freedom as one of its key tenets. Um, the university offered a course on academic freedom and cooperated with a number of scholars who left or were forced to leave the higher school of economics as it became more and more aligned with the goals of the government and the presidential administration. Um, the Professional Societies Manifesto identified as one of its key objectives the opposition to any attempts to, to restrict the freedom of scientific um, research and academic freedom. Its members lend their expertise on academic freedom to independent media outlets and organize debates dedicated to the issue. The Trade Unions Charter declared the aim of protecting academic freedom, which includes, and here I quote their definition because it's a quite extensive one, the freedom to choose a subject and topic of research, the freedom to teach, and the freedom to publicly express one's opinion, both uh, in a higher education institution and outside of it. The, this organization saw the students as the main target of academic freedom promotion activities. Among scholars, they considered that there are some who already understand what it is and others to whom it does not even make sense to explain. And here I quote my, uh, my interview uh, with one of the members. The trade union used public statements to promote academic freedom. For instance, in February 2021, they issued a resolution against politically motivated repressions in higher education. Finally, Troitsky Variant Nauka, the editorial policy 
um, of this, uh, this journal includes, among other aims, the countering of degradation of Russian science and the need to reform the system of financing and managing science. And while academic freedom is not explicitly emphasized, it is at the heart of the system of science Troitsky variant would like to see implemented in Russia. Over the years, the journal has also published a number of articles dedicated to academic freedom. Now, before I move on to discussing how these four organizations have been coping since the war started, I will remind the audience very briefly how the academic community in Russia reacted to the invasion of Ukraine. In March 2022, which is soon after the war started, the most significant organization of university leaders, the Russian Union of Rectors, issued an infamous letter rendering support to the president. The signatories explicitly supported the aims of demilitarization and the denazification of Ukraine invoked by the Kremlin. The relatively short letter added that universities have always been the backbone of the state, um, and I quote here. Within less than a month, the letter gathered over 160 signatures, including the heads of top Russian institutions such as Moscow State University, as well as uh, those deemed the bastions of liberalism, such as the Higher School of, Econo Higher School of Economics, uh, Vishka. Um, this apparent support for the government can be seen as a direct consequence of previous infringements on university autonomy. In particular, the measures taken to assure that rectors are elected by the state rather than by the university community. And this is what, what Yevgeny has been alluding to in, in his presentation. This support continues as so that the support lent by the universities to the Russian state. Um, the universities quickly and without visible resistance accepted higher education institutions from Ukraine's occupied territories as part of Russian higher education system. The Higher School of Economics became the training hub for these institutions, which basically illustrates that Russian universities have become one of the tools for normalizing the, the invasion and occupation of parts of Ukraine. Individual Russian scholars responded in a number of ways. Resistance took the form of public criticism of the war expressed through open letters and via social media posts. Many have taken a difficult decision to leave Russian academia and the country. Uh, there were also multiple forced resignations for expressing anti-war positions, uh, mostly followed by a decision to leave the country. The partial mobiliz mobilization introduced in September 2022 forced another group of scholars and students to seek refuge abroad. Now, there have been many who approached the war more opportunistically and or lent their authority to justify the so-called special military operation. Many remained silent or contributed to normalizing the war, for instance, by using the term spetsoperatia, special operation, even in casual con conversations with colleagues. Uh, meanwhile, the Russian government was very quick and effective to introduce measures that further curbed academic freedom. And let me show you some of those measures. Um, and art in March 2022, soon after the, the outbreak of the war, an article was added to the criminal code, which envisions up to 15 years imprisonment for sp spreading so-called fake news about the Russian military. Another article forbids discrediting the use of Russian military. Another article punishes, call punishes calls for and support for sanctions against Russia. Uh, there have been changes to the administrative code, which envision fines and administrative arrest for identifying the Soviet Union with Nazi Germany. Uh, the Russian state also took steps to increase control over what is taught at the universities. In March 2022, the Ministry of Science and Higher Education announced its plans to review history textbooks and to introduce a single unified history course across the whole of higher education. And a year later, so just this February, the Expert Council for the Development of Higher Education approved the concept of teaching Russian history from, for non-historical degrees. This means that as of September this year, a unified content, of content will be taught at all universities of the country. The concept uh, is a hefty document of over, over 100 pages, and it outlines the themes to be introduced to the students. Importantly, the teaching of history, according to this document, includes the developments up to the year 2022. 
Hence, it becomes an instrument of what to teach about contemporary Russian politics on top of teaching about Russian history. Now, against this really difficult and challenging backdrop, let me return to the four organizations and their responses. Um, initially, the three universities started offering what I would call subversive teaching activities, widening the curriculum to include new course, course offers, for instance, about pacifism. Its academic council issued a statement emphasizing that any sanctions against official Russian academia should be implemented, bearing in mind that many individual scholars and students oppose the war. Uh, the Council also, also condemned the Russian government's cutting of ties with the European education system, warning that it would lead the, to the isolation of Russian universities from the world and to the destruction of academic rights and freedoms. More recently, and this is, this is um, genuinely last week's news, the Prosecutor General's Office declared the Free University an undesirable organization and since participation in the activities of such an organization can lead to prosecution, the university suspended its activities on the territory of the Russian Federation. The Professional Society um, published a statement um, in March 2022 and declaring its outrage at the use of historical justifications for withdrawing borders. So here the, the criticism is veiled and um, there, there, there wasn't an outright criticism of the war um, just a, um, another, another sort of version of, 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 of saying it. At present, however, the society seems inactive and its website is no longer available. The Trade Union, um, the third of my organizations, issued a statement against the persecution of lecturers for their civic position, underlining that academic freedoms have come under threat as a re result of the war. Uh, following the partial mobilization, the website of this organization has become an important source of information and legal advice related to the mobilization. Meanwhile, the parent organization of Troitsky Variant Nauka uh, was declared a foreign agent. Shortly after this happened, I interviewed one of its employees who was certain that they would be closing shop. Ultimately, however, the print edition was suspended, but the online edition is still in operation. The chief editor emphasized that in the wake of being declared a foreign agent, the journal received a wave of, of popular support. Zooming in on the four grassroots initiatives allows me to conclude this presentation with a few broad, broader, of, although still tentative remarks regarding the links between academic freedom, university auto autonomy and um, authoritarianism. Let me show you uh, this on a, on a very short slide, and this is my last one. A more general observation about the Russian case is that the context of war allows us to see more clearly what, in conditions of peace, uh, may have been overlooked or downplayed. War showed us that academia is very much within rather than outside of politics. We can also see that university autonomy is a deeply flawed concept in non-democracies. Uh, very sadly, indeed, the higher education has not escaped the self-destructive consequences of this war for Russia. The degradation of uh, academic freedom has been, has been proceeding alongside the annihilation of the results of a long and difficult process of reforming Russian higher education and research and integrating it in um, international networks. Now, since authoritarianism, and this is my, my second concluding point, since authoritarianism is a collection of various practices and approaches, there are in, inevitably gradations of authoritarianism. Uh, and while it might have appeared that with uh, the ch changes to the Russian constitution introduced in 2020, the scale of control and repression reached its peak, the situation, the situation actually worsened dramatically since the start of the war. From that, it follows that academic freedom, even in uh, non-democracies, is, is better understood as a process rather than as a constant condition that either exists or doesn't. Responses to the war across my four cases not only differed, but also fluctuated over time, something that I um, didn't really have the time to show. But they were at times more optimistic and at, and at times really quite bravely defiant. With time, a few coercive state policies became almost redundant. Uh, for instance, the foreign agent label 
can now be worn as a badge of honor, although it is still considered burdensome. Other repressive policies have had a more lethal effect, uh, in, in particular the inclusion of on the list of undesirable organizations. Um, I would like to finish on a cautiously optimistic note, though. First, the free university really wants to rebuild itself outside of Russia, while still catering to Russian students. Second, with the number of extraordinarily talented scholars now outside of the country, there is plenty of intellectual potential for reimagining Russia of the future. Crucially, however, um, these, those scholars need support. Uh, they have families, most of them, uh, those I know, are um, supporting three to four family members that left Russia with them. All of them received temporary positions for a few months' time, up to a year, some were offer, offered extensions. I am sure that many of us know scholars in a similar situation, and my question would be whether we have done enough to offer or demand longer-term support for them. Otherwise, the talent to understand Russia will uh, really be greatly impoverished. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you for the enlightening points and for the important uh, statements uh, at the end. Uh, so, Jenny, please. Um, so we're moving into the Q&A mode. And for people on Zoom, we're really excited to hear your thoughts too and your questions. I, I see we have one coming already. Um, I I want to start um, us off with just one question that I wanted to pose to both. Um, I think it is um, what came especially in Eugenie's uh, talk, but also in Kaiser's talk, and in a less um, in a more implicit way, is that the the concept of academic freedom in Russia might be somewhat different uh, from what we um, sort of by default imply when we talk about academic freedom. And I'm I'm not sure if this is just my impression, um, or um, but for example, when you know thinking about how academics in Russia, I think about self censorship um, in a sort of a collective way, rather than uh, not just about you know uh, silencing their voice, but um, thinking about threats to them as a, as a community, uh, threats to self governance. And I, I was wondering if, if this is what you see in your work, uh, both of you, um, that Russian academics view academic freedom um, in a particular way, uh, or is this ideal that they have uh, in their mind, is it basically the same that we, uh, what, that we have when we're thinking about academia in the West? So uh, yeah, I was curious about both of your uh, thoughts on this. Um, Oh, I'll start. Um, yeah, Katya, do you want to start? Uh, maybe, and then Gini. Hi, sorry, I, I didn't hear the last sentence. Was it uh, calling me to start or? Uh, yeah, if, if okay. you'd like. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Yes, yes, uh, this, is, uh, this is really a very important question. Thank you so much. Um, in a way, whether the concept of academic freedom is different in Russia, this is a very a very dangerous territory because uh, this question invites, even though the audience has seen from our presentation presentations that um, the community reacts differently to um, to sanctions, uh, and the sanctions are really enormous. It, it, it really is necessary to understand the tension, um, especially now uh, under which this, this community functions. But to ask whether this concept is different different in Russia, invites um, cultural relativism. Uh, and I don't think it serves academics uh, in Russia and, and beyond Russia to, to invite this, this relativism. Um, academic freedom is a concept that, that, that should help um, academics, and I think it works in our own interest, that it is uniform and really across the globe. Uh, but when I said that uh, what I'd like to propose is to um, suggest that academic freedom is not a constant state, it, it exists or it doesn't, but it's a process. Um, so we should be understanding it um, as, as really an interplay between policies introduced by the government to silence, most, mostly and in most cases also outside of Russia, to silence the critics. 
Um, and as a process, rather than as a constant, as a fact, it's easier also to show that there still exists independent thinking in Russia. We can't just generalize that, well, it's, it's an authoritarian system now, and no, um, no academics from Russia should be trusted, because this, this uh, sort of the lack of academic freedom directly leads into, to the mistrust uh, in science emanating from Russia. So this would be my position, but thank you, an excellent question. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Anton, uh, so much uh, for the question. I think I am on the same page with Kasia, maybe just on a uh, different line. Um, as research in conceptual history indicated, contest, uh, concepts can be contested and vary across uh, political and cultural contexts. But I am strongly against uh, taking Russia as a sort of exotic case where everything is uh, different, quite the opposite. Uh, as with many other uh, spheres, uh, Russia actually important, uh, imp important made made many regulations uh, from uh, the international uh, sphere and integrated the concept of academic freedom, freedom in its own legislation, in uh, the law on education, in uh, the uh, civic code and so on and so on. So I don't think the concept itself is very different. But what Russia can be uh, useful uh, to show is uh, that when you look at this case, uh, you see how uh, even within the formally uh, proper institutional design, power can easily flow uh, from you know uh, one uh, authority to another, and thereby uh, in fact empower the central administration, the administration of universities. And this might be just you know a, a, a grotesque uh, example of the tendencies that uh, may take place uh, elsewhere. And from what I hear uh, in the uh, freedom of speech debate uh, here in the states. Some of these tendencies are evident here as well, especially you know the tendency to self-censor. Mm -hmm. uh, what Russian example shows is the consequences uh, of uh, uh, certain institutional re reforms uh, when power spills uh, in favor of administration, when academics uh, lose the ability to uh, control the way they are governed and how mm -hmm. the uh, community uh, of meaning within which you can discuss actually the, the content of uh, academic freedom falls apart. So this is what Russia could be useful for if you look at a broader debate on academic freedom. Thanks to you both. So we'll try to alternate questions from Zoom and from the room and let's start from question from the room. Oh, can I start again? Thank you for, for the talk. Uh, I want to ask you, what do you think is the role of higher education? Let me give you some background. I don't want to go too into detail. The one side says the marketplace of ideas, which is like the, the freedom of speech and like the media and stuff. And on the other side, the well, role of uh, education or I mean teaching or learning, whatever you want to call it. I don't know whether that's happening. Then research, then some some of them do marketing, mm -hmm. like MIT, which you know, sells these products and everything. In terms of the marketplace of ideas, even the United States research universities have never been place of research, I mean, marketplace of ideas. You have the university senate controlling them, you have the tenor system controlling them. And people go through that process, which is you know, dropping people who are, have different ideas and different concepts. Right now, in the South Florida, you can't even talk about diversity, inclusion, and uh, whatever. I, I know that's like a, some intellectual crap that they have there, like the critical race. I'm sorry, it's a critical race theory, it's an intellectual crap, but nobody's free to criticize it back there. Even in big universities like Columbia, if you say that critical race theory or social justice is not a good cause, you're fired. And this is a true thing in big universities right now. You can't have a marketplace of ideas where 
everybody thinks that the liberal side is the correct one or the conservative side is the correct one. So what do you think about that? I mean, I know Russia is a very extreme case of you know, you know harassing and you know, it, it doesn't have to be here. But there's no freedom of expression in Marcus, I guess, in the, in the United States. The system is not structured that way. What do you think about it? What's the role of the university? Yeah, sorry, can I just have your name? Wilson. Wilson. Um, should we uh, take one by one question? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Wilson. Thank you for, for this wonderful question. Um, you are totally right. Uh, Russia is an extreme case, but uh, you're also totally right in emphasizing the, uh, the extreme part. It is still the case uh, of what's going on in academia at large, with just the extreme end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, surely, uh, the, the, the discussion about the role of academia in higher education is not as advanced uh, in Russia as uh, it is here. It's not as polarized uh, as it is uh, here. But there is, I think, um, competition of ideas. Uh, I think it, it is still uh, stuck at the level where both uh, you know, universities, uh, uh, social actors, and, and also the state itself uh, argue whether it is a public good or a service that we need to provide. And in fact, uh, the regulation adopted and then enacted <laughs> seeks to ensure quality assurance in both fields, like in the field of public good, the higher edu education and the public good, and in the field of service. That's why students have such a leverage over universities when they can complain to a prosecutor's office or to the watchdog uh, when they are unhappy with uh, you know, services provided. That's this is what makes university fear uh, the students. But then uh, the universities also fear the state because the state controls them uh, when it comes to the allocation of uh, uh, budget subsidies mm -hmm. and so on. There is, I guess, uh, less of uh, a debate on what it is that uh, this public good is, like uh, what kind of... Uh, uh, ideas it should serve, uh, Kasia might uh, know it uh, better as she did uh, previously searching that. But there was a conservative turn in Russia uh, that uh, tried to impose the idea of, uh, um, on the university, the idea of uh, teaching uh, in a style that would uh, support uh, the so-called sovereignist ideology, you know, family values, uh, anything that wouldn't disrupt those ideas. Something similar, I guess, uh, to what's going on in Florida or mm -hmm. similar places. So it is uh, still stuck in, in that stage. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's both sides. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't know what you heard about what happened in Stanford when the federal judge started talking and they started cursing him out. The dean was there involved in not allowing him to speak and everything. That's crazy, I was like. Yeah, I think that was more of a free speech issue, though. And I yeah, agree with you. It was, it was kind of suppression of free speech by the students who were future lawyers. Kind of strange. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah. Uh, so let, uh, let, let us move to Zoom for a second. And the question from Zoom is actually, a, in a way, a continuation of the question. Uh, the system is a question from John Hedershaw, University of Exeter. Uh, the system of bureaucratic control and attitudes towards senior managers you describe in Russia sounds a more extreme version of what we have in Britain. Um, surprisingly, high levels of self-censorship are also reported in surveys of UK academics. Uh, however, what's different in, is the politically motivated dismissals and surveillance by students and colleagues. In that sense, aren't we back to the liberal slash authoritarian distinction to explain, uh, to explain what distinguishes greater from lesser academic freedom? Um, and maybe Kasia would also want to weigh on this um, as someone who is probably uh, well aware of the uh, education system in Britain. Uh, so yeah, whichever of you wants to tackle this. 
Okay, I, I can I can go first. Could I also have a comment on the the previous question, though? If you if you allow us, uh, okay. Um, so but the previous question was um, very much uh, underlining that academic freedom has been under attack worldwide, um, and this is this is very much confirmed by scholars at risk reports and by the academic freedom index. So we can see the situation clearly, and it's uh, it's not not only happening in, in non-democratic countries uh, or for authoritarian countries, but also in democracies. Um, in the United States, uh, as well as in Britain, I believe that universities very much reflect the political divide and political struggles uh, between conservatism and liberalism. So there is uh, the marketplace is, of ideas is in a way reduced to, uh, to the politica political struggles between the two. And um, however, Russia is an extreme case in that there is no political struggle to reflect in the higher education system and in academic debates. There is mainly conservatism uh, and mainly a, a very special version of, of conservatism, uh, which very much has been um, the, the dominant feature of the political scene um, ever since the 2012. Uh, or, so for a, for a very long time now, for a decade now. Um, so in a way, the marketplace of ideas is very much limited by what's possible by the authoritarian system. And here, I think John Hattershaw's question uh, can be answered. So it's it's still, I, I constantly make this comparison, being myself located in the British academic system and researching the, the, the Russian academic system, I constantly make comparisons. And yet, what is possible to say and what is possible to research in Britain is still largely uh, incomparably uh, different to, to what is possible in, in, in Russia. And I have just recently returned from an ISA, which is International Studies Association conference taking place in Montreal. And uh, colleagues there who, uh, or, or former colleagues from, from, from Russia, uh, were really unwilling to engage in any discussions uh, about the present international politics, which are very much dominated by the war. Um, but, but, but the scale of self-censorship self is, is absolutely enormous uh, and it concerns that the academic sort of the, the academic um, the academic subjects um, in Great Britain the self-censorship mostly focuses on uh, one's own um, circumstances or one's own employment one's own, one's own relationship with the institution. Uh, I'm not saying that the system and uh, the, the situation is, is perfect, but it still is a, a categorical difference. Thank you. I may I just yes. add a footnote to this. So, uh, I, it might seem, well, the whole picture of the Russian academia might just seem so horrendous uh, from, from these accounts. Um, but I would like to just uh, add a footnote to say uh, it is not as horrendous uh, as it seems. It is, well, as uh, previously a head of school, uh, I learned, uh, for instance, how to play around this uh, conservative term. So what mattered was that you just hide certain things uh, from, from the rector or from, from the public side. Like you don't release certain news into the news, public news, uh, and then you're free to run whatever you want. Uh, that is how we managed to uh, run a student essay contest where uh, the first prize was given to a paper on LGBT plus uh, community in St. Petersburg, and we managed to give a, to give a prize uh, to that person. And uh, that's how many people uh, did research uh, on uh, uh, this and uh, other gender uh, issues uh, on uh, uh, non-systemic opposition and so on and so on. So topics that would be considered extremely dangerous uh, if they were uh, somewhere in, in the public domain. It is, again, not a, <laughs> a, a truly liberal system, but it is not yet a total totalitarianism. <laughs> Right, so we'll take a question from the room. Yeah, thanks so much, Fascinating. Yeah, and um, I really much like Evgeny, your last slide, yeah, that you indicated as a major problem. 
And I would like to add to that if you uh, would you like to just introduce yourself to. Oh, I'm Julia Lyles. I am a leader and associate professor here at Taiwan Institute and uh, Department of Statistics. Uh, so you move to the problem from so to say the level of the just a professor, yeah. But there is also another view, I think, from the level of administrator. I know several cases when already during the war, some uh, you know some professors who I'm sure are against the war, they have taken administrative position because you know some other administrators left, and you know, and their justification is is uh, you know the same that I'm taking this position. I will be a dean now because nobody else wants to be a dean, and I want to save the community, and that makes the situation even more difficult in a way because it's such a you know, and everybody knows that. Against. Yeah, and uh, so the community is sort of say cemented. You can't do anything from below because you know you have this dean whom you trust and support, and and vice versa. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's like. Yeah. Thank you. This is uh, brilliant. Uh, I think when when I was offered uh, this job of uh, head of school, I I always had the same motivation. Yeah, yeah. You, you you could tell perhaps that uh, I might have been too young to take that uh, position, but since there was no other internal candidate, and everyone thought, well, we really need to secure this position for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I I sort of felt like I was forced to more or less. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh take it uh, just to preserve the community and to have a chance to run things uh, the way we want mm -hmm. but you left yeah yeah but I would, it was a different yeah, story yeah, yeah yeah i know yeah. so, so it's, it's it's a i think a lot of unpacked yeah. yeah okay so we have a question from youtube but i think it has been answered essentially which is about uh academic freedom in authoritarian regimes versus non-authoritarian ones. I think we spoke a lot about it. So let's continue with the room. Um, and yes, please, everyone, introduce yourself. Um, my name is Victoria. I'm the Dickens for Retirement Institute. And I have two questions. Um, so the first one is regarding, well, whether your attendance actually reflected somehow on the other side of academic freedoms, uh, which is not about political restrictions versus um, freedom of speech or freedom of um, teaching certain topics, but also what's going on inside the community. Because the research that was done by Elena Patapova um, showed that, that actually there are many similarities between democratic regimes and authoritarian regimes in terms of how academic community formulates for itself what can be done uh, inside the department and what cannot be done in terms of the research that you can conduct. So people did a lot of um, self-restriction in, in terms of methodologies that they can pick. Mm -hmm. And in some cases were actually well, almost bullied in case if the methodology that they picked was not in line with what the department wanted to do. Um, so yeah, this study was done, like, I think she ended asking questions by the end of 2020, so it's pre-war, uh, but still maybe you had some kind of narratives, um, uh, narratives in, uh, in the answers of your respondents. And the second question is exactly about this last slide that you showed. Um, because maybe I'm wrong and I'm sort of misinterpreting it, but it seemed to me that uh, you're trying to show that there is certain sense of community or solidarity inside the academic community, which to me is a little bit surprising. Um, because this exact narrative of um, please don't say anything or post anything on social media um because it's going to harm us as an institution us as a department etc um i observed a lot as something that actually disrupts the community and actually something that is that goes against the community so you start fighting inside the community because some people want to post certain things on social media 
Sam doesn't want to do that. And to me, the downfall of higher school economics as a community started from something like that, that people were actually yeah, prevented from, I don't know, giving comments to the media, for example. Um, moreover, I'm not sure that there is such thing as Russian academic community. Um, from how it looks right now, at least when people are scattered all over the places, people who might take similar stance on uh, Russian invasion. And I don't know, both colleagues are against the war, but one person stayed in Russia, one left. And then there is a big fight between them because those who left are kind of judging those who stayed, vice versa. So I'm interested in how do you see this and whether you think that nevertheless, there are certain horizontal ties uh, between people, um, yeah, and we have in the future. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Victoria, thank you so much uh, for these questions. I'm grateful because uh, now I have a chance to clarify what uh, I have been talking about. Um, no, uh, I, I know this article by Elizabeth Patapova. She presented it uh, at uh, one of the conferences where we were together uh, with us and uh, her. Actually, it was, I think, the National Studies Association, 2019. Um, Elizabeth's Lisa, research uh, uh, is uh, slightly different. She does focus on, on the narratives, uh, while uh, we were interested in the issue of uh, status and standing within uh, a sort of academic republic, uh, whether it exists or not, and how that might into might uh, fit into the Mm, understanding of oneself as a free or unfree subject within uh, university system. So that is why the issues you were asking about what kind of research uh, is possible at all or what kind of methodologies uh, could be chosen, uh, those issues did not transpire from other interviews somebody because we didn't ask uh, uh, about them. And uh, I, I would just respond that um, what people talk about uh, is indeed the idea of uh, community. I, I never mentioned, uh, I, I believe in my talk, uh, uh, a Russian academic community, uh, nor do I believe there is such, such a thing. But our respondents did mention uh, uh, small communities uh, that uh, formed around uh, uh, individual departments like at the High School of Economics or where I was at Ranipa, which is also famous for having you know, uh, several uh, pockets of uh, liberal education and where people actually did identify uh, with this uh, small units. And this is what I meant. And this is exceptional. Uh, and uh, that is why uh, I was uh, sort of uh, happy to having found this uh, uh, narrative on exceptionality. And this is where I identified, I identified uh, this uh, idea of uh, self-censorship as care. Overall, the picture is different and you're right uh, in uh, the way you assess it. Indeed, one, one respondent from the Far East uh, identified exactly this in, 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 in straightforward terms uh, uh, that individual uh, claim there is no such a thing as uh, a university republic. You must be kidding me, <laughs> he told me. Uh, I, I don't identify with anyone uh, with whom I work. Uh, you know, this is not a republic. But uh, that uh, person insisted. I rather identify with uh, other scholars uh, who are based in uh, other universities in Russia. And we do form this uh, Republic of Letters uh, instead. So I would say there are those uh, uh, local communities, not necessarily uh, in a geographic locality, but these things uh, do exist. But then, yeah, you're right. So when, when people uh, talk about uh, what's possible and uh, impossible to say in public, when administration uh, at all levels, most senior to immediate administration tell you not to do or not to say certain things uh, in the media. 
it does uh, erode the community. And this is what we heard in several interviews. Uh, people were irritated and in fact uh, driven to self-isolation when they heard something like that from uh, their chairs. It was mentioned in St. Petersburg and also in Samara and uh, elsewhere. Right. Um, Kasia, do you want to comment on this too? Uh, because I think even if we look at the grassroots communities, there probably is also some tension, but I was wondering what you're saying this. Absolutely, I very much agree with you, Virginia. Both, both grass, grassroots, grassroots initiatives very, very much rely on uh, small communities and, and sometimes really very small communities of, of extremely dedicated people who uh, most of the times just dedicate their, their own time and are not paid for their, um, their dedication and their time. And so those small communities definitely exist, uh, even if those larger com a larger academic community has not existed in Russia for a, for a longer period of time. This is uh, one of the arguments of, of my book that relied on research conducted from 2016 to 2018. And this brings me to the point that periodization nowadays is really important because of how quickly um, academic freedoms have deteriorated or the, the protection of academic freedom has deteriorated in, in Russia. Um, so it's, it's a, a, a very important whether we speak about 2016 or 18 or 20 or the post-war situation because it has been uh, what is possible to say research and teach has been has been changing uh, unfortunately for, for, for worse. Thank you. Um, other questions? My name is Carmen. I'm a second year Aramid student. I have two short questions. My first question is, does this uh, lead into like high school education? Right? Um, and then my second question, initially, in the beginning of the war, a lot of universities kind of opposed the war, and then they went completely opposite and supported the war, like publicly came out with a letter. And then you see, we saw a massive exodus of like Russian intellectuals and college professors. What impact does this have? And how is this community kind of like formed abroad? Um, from like a greater um, is this question to me or I mean, to both? Yeah. Kaisa, would you like to comment? Is it possible to restate this question? It was from the back of the room and I, I didn't really hear it uh, properly. Okay. Yeah. You want to restate it or you just want to? She probably can't hear. Yeah, can you just. Uh, I don't yeah, I was listening. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that's um, from here. Yeah, sorry. Um, my first question is Is this, has this bled into like high school education where, you know, kids, it's chosen what kids are taught, like particularly in history and other subjects? And then my, uh, that was my first question. And my second question is um, initially, a lot of universities came against the war and then that changed quickly where they publicly even went and support the war and a lot of like directors of the school came out with letters supporting the war, which in turn a lot of Russian professors and intellectuals have left the country but now they're, you know, universities in the Western universities potentially teaching because they didn't want to be associated with the support of the war. Like what implications does that play at large? Right, so I, I think I understood the first part of your question, which was about secondary education, right? And whether. Um... Right. Yeah, yes. can we try it and go I, with I, this one? And maybe again, you could continue with the second part. Okay, so the secondary education actually was uh, was first. The, 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 as far as I am aware, and I've been researching mainly the higher education, but as far as I am aware, secondary education and the teaching of history in secondary education was the, was the, the priority for the government and the introduction of, of sort of a, a way of teaching a Russian history and, and a unified and uniform narrative has been introduced there first, and it is now spreading onto the tertiary education. Um, but again, I'm I'm not an expert on, on secondary education in, in, in Russia. And I will leave you again to, to, to answer the, the, the second part of your question. I think I would just add uh, that when it comes to um, high school education, uh, the regulation is a lot more uh, stricter. Uh, 
they actually uh, dictate people what, what to say. There is uh, no academic freedom whatsoever at this uh, level. Uh, but again, there, <laughs> I'm sure uh, people would object to me saying that uh, because there are, again, this, uh, uh, specific schools that are granted more liberty than the others. So uh, like, uh, I have a relative who works as a history teacher in one of the most advanced uh, gymnasiums in St. Petersburg. And up until recently, he could say whatever he wanted to say in the classroom. He's a brilliant uh, teacher as well as a public intellectual. And he was safe until uh, the school got a, an anonymous report on him for mm -hmm. his uh, uh, anti-war uh, standing. <laughs> so that freedom ends at some point. And uh, uh, a broader picture, uh, Actually, uh, I, it's the first time I hear that uh, someone at the level of university spoke out against the war. Uh, I don't think I know uh, those cases. Uh, universities rather quickly into the war started to adopt pro war statement. And in fact, this is the issue I took with uh, my university. And it was a, uh, early March when the council uh, had to uh, discuss the pro war statement and vote on it. So, uh, so it was rather uh, soon into the war, but uh, I would say that was a, a top bottom uh, initiative. It, I don't think it came from the universities itself. I am somehow convinced that uh, it was orchestrated by the government at different uh, levels. And uh, uh, it was not met uh, uh, enthusiastically by the communities of those uh, universities. Like, uh, for instance, uh, one of the biggest universities in the country, St. Petersburg State University, uh, there uh, an academic community uh, wrote uh, its own petition uh, denouncing what the rector signed uh, and uh, stating that they are against the war. <laughs> it was so big that the the university our leadership uh, decided that they need to orchestrate a different petition <laughs> by those who are uh, in support of war, but that one didn't uh, get as many signatures as the anti-war petition, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, now, the, now many of our academies are displaced, uh, you're right, and we just uh, had last week uh, uh, a great conference uh, here at uh, Harriman organized together with uh, uh, Bar College, uh, and that conference uh, brought together a lot of, uh, well, many scholars who are now mostly in the US, uh, and some uh, are in Europe. Uh, I think the situation is very much precarious. No one really uh, understands uh, what is to be done next. Most of the scholars, like us, as I said, uh, are on short-term uh, contracts, like uh, one year, two years max, and some even on you know, shorter internships. Some struggle with the immigration status in Europe because they left on Schengen visas and uh, they cannot go back, <laughs> nor can they travel uh, anymore because uh, the visas uh, are expiring. So <laughs> everyone feels like, uh, uh, we are suspended in the air, but there are initiatives uh, to build networks. So uh, um, some are uh, bigger, like the one uh, Kaisa mentioned, which is uh, the initiative uh, to put together again uh, a free university, Svobodny Universitet. Uh, uh, then uh, there are projects uh, to relocate some of the liberal schools uh, from Russia to Armenia and uh, uh, elsewhere in Europe. And uh, I'm hoping those uh, projects uh, will materialize. And uh, some of us try to put together uh, think tanks uh, to contribute to a broader debate uh, about the world's US and Europe's uh, policy towards uh, Russia uh, as a whole, towards the Russian academia. Yeah, so there are many things that are shaping up now. Elise? Can I just make a comment on this point? Um, yeah, um, that's really interesting to think about the international community outside of Russia of scholars. And it just reminds me of 
the 60 Minutes episode, which is a news program um, about uh, this really sad story of this uh, school that was founded by a woman in Afghanistan. And then as the Taliban took over, she um, took the girls, it, it was a boarding, she took them out and they recreated this school um, in uh, a country in Africa, I don't remember where, and it's all funded. And it's kind of like the most elite of the elite of the future of Afghanistan. And the whole time it was breaking my heart, like they are trying to take a core, a kernel of, of educated girls and raise them to be the future for Afghanistan. And someone's paying for that. But it actually made me think that, you know, maybe there are funding organizations here um, that are looking for what to do and how to respond. And there are, you know, I'm not saying this is what they'd be interested in, but it is interesting to think about the recreation of an entire university outside the borders um, in order to keep those international networks going and maybe foster this idea of a critical, critically thinking um, opposition or just free thinking um, Russian citizens. Um, so I wonder if, you know, you guys or other people in your community would think about how they might approach it and which kind of um, think tank, that's the word, not, not think tanks, which kind of um, um, NGOs or um, foundations um, might, might be interested in um, contributing to that because I think a lot of the Western think tanks are at a loss. They don't know how to respond to the war either. They, they're not really sure, you know, what is the best thing to do. So it, it might be a, um, kind of a concrete and interesting um, approach. But anyway, just a thought. You want to comment? I think, yeah, this is exactly what uh, we are doing with some of the okay. colleagues. Uh, we are trying to put together uh, a small network. Uh, now we have uh, around 10 scholars for <laughs> dispersed across the US and uh, set up uh, a, first a think tank, but we want to have first a small community and then uh, open it for a small program, but then uh, eventually create uh, you know, uh, a more or less complete school with undergraduate, graduate and uh, postgraduate uh, education yeah. to which most of the scholars who are now lost here and there could uh, contribute. Yeah, yeah. It just uh, it takes time, you know, to write a concept that to contact the donor, then the donor says, well, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's a expensive have to... proposition, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. Exactly, right. this is what they say. It might probably need some private sector um, support or one of the big thing tanks. Anyway. Um, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Damon Lee. I work with Scholar Risk uh, here in Rome. So it's hi, hi. everybody. And it's also very nice to see Cassia. We've exchanged emails over the years. So it's good to see her on the screen. Um, I'm wondering if, if either of you might be able to comment a little bit on um, the situation of more junior scholars uh, in the academy, those who are coming into the profession after finishing their, their doctoral programs. and what is the situation for them at the moment? How have their, maybe through your research you're getting, how have their relations been with more senior academics uh, who have maybe had more experience dealing with uh, more trying times in the academy and dealing with self-censorship? I'm interested maybe hearing about how fears of brain drain uh, have perhaps come up as well. Not just junior academics who are leaving because they're worried about their um, how their expression is endangering them, but even those who have yet to enter PhD programs who are thinking, do I want to go into this? So what does this mean, I guess, for like, I hate to use the word the pipeline, but the pipeline of academia in Russia? Um, and I suppose the second question area that any, any thoughts would be great to hear is on, um, I suppose, the role of more traditional international education programs and uh, exchanges, these sorts of things that we've seen in the universities over the years, and how international education has been used it's as a soft power tool as well. I think maybe in this case, how it offers perhaps some opportunities for members of the Russian Academy to be able to go to institutions on a short term basis where they have perhaps you know, some more, appreci more appreciable level of academic freedom. But also, particularly looking at younger academics, students, graduate students, and their ability to to engage in those sorts of exchanges. 
considering that this is a very, you know, this is not a very short term problem that we're dealing with, this is long term. And so, how does that play into it? Also, considering how a lot of universities around the world have cut their ties. That's a very you know, kind of messy political situation. So, I don't think in the short term you're going to see any universities jumping back in into the pool, but you know, what should people around the world be considering long term? Okay, yeah, thanks. This is a big question. Uh, I would say, well, as a starter, the, the pipeline has been disrupted. Um, there are different um, uh, scenarios and, that are available to junior scholars now. You're right in thinking that uh, international education uh, programs like all these exchanges uh, socialized uh, a lot of students uh, into this uh, global world of academia. Like, uh, they even changed mindsets. Uh, and I know for a fact that uh, uh, our students, uh, students uh, from high school of uh, economics uh, and uh, Shining Car and uh, elsewhere, well, many of them were uh, oriented uh, towards uh, continuing uh, education somewhere else outside of Russia. And that was, in fact, part of uh, our and more general policy to prevent brain drain. Uh, they were thinking of going somewhere and getting a PhD, and then coming back and get a, 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 a decent position within uh, a decent Russian institution. This, this is what uh, the high school of uh, economics had been promoting all the time. They were willing to, uh, more willing to hire people with uh, international uh, degrees <laughs> than the local ones. And students uh, soon realized this. So they thought of this as a possible uh, career track. Uh, now it is uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, but there is still an intention uh, that many have uh, to uh, pursue their degrees outside of Russia and then uh, decide whether they want to return or not. Uh, and uh, the problem now is that uh, they are a little, not so little, and they are profoundly confused as to where apply, whether uh, their applications would be treated uh, favorably because uh, of the country of origin. Uh, but I received a number of uh, requests to write a recommendation uh, to, to Princeton or uh, elsewhere. Students want to uh, apply and want to go, uh, but they are lost and uh, scared and as and to the whole und undertaking. But they do invest. I know uh, a case of our best graduates from my program in St. Petersburg who entered uh, a master program at the High School of Economics, which is taught in English. And even though they were uh, accepted into a program which I think is better than uh, the one they actually chose, so, but they chose this for the reason it was taught in English, because they want to improve their English in order to apply then for uh, a PhD program somewhere in Europe or US. Uh, a more serious level students, um, they are in the same situation. They're looking uh, for doctoral programs. Uh, uh, they are, even those uh, who didn't plan it, they're now looking for uh, doctoral programs, uh, but they don't feel confident about uh, you know, their uh, academic records or whether they would be competitive uh, when they apply where to apply, uh, how to get a, a supervisor. So that takes a lot of effort uh, from someone who is in a closed country when you cannot go to a conference and meet someone. So that kind of uh, challenges uh, that I could think of right away. Thank you. Um, I think Kasia's perspective would be for this as well. Right. So, uh, in terms of Evgeny's last point, uh, indeed, our uh, our school here in Edinburgh received this year a record number of PhD applications from um, students who uh, who had Russian passports, were no longer based in, in Russia, but uh, but but but, but uh, um, wanted to apply as, as Russian citizens. 
um, this is my first comment. My second comment is that when I was finishing my, my longer term research uh, in St. Petersburg and in Moscow, which was 2018, um, this already was a time where uh, my interviewees did not consider Russian academia as a um, potential career, sort of prosperous and, and favorable career track. Uh, some of uh, professors at the Higher School of Economics whom I interviewed considered their own institution as an institution that gives students a chance to uh, be able to, to, to move, and con move abroad and continue their studies um, elsewhere outside of Russia. Uh, they, they very much viewed the Higher School of Economics as, as making it possible uh, for students just because of the higher standard of, um, of education, because of uh, many courses being uh, carried out in, in, in English language, something Evgeny also alluded uh, mentioned. Um, so all, already five years ago, this, this wasn't considered a, a, um, a good career track to, to stay and um, do a PhD in, in Russian academia. Um, however, and this was a time when the Russian higher education was still very big on building international ties, the internationalization drive um, for which enormous uh, funds were, were dedicated from the state budget, um, for instance, via such programs as Five One Hundred, which were which were streamlining funds to specific universities to, to be able to employ international faculty members, uh, to be able to lead international research um, and publish in internationally respected journals. So this was this was back then, and I, I, I do believe that the situation worsened since then. Um, uh, the Russian higher education system uh, has been building for the past couple of years, has been building ties with um, Chinese higher education system. So I believe those who are interested in, in that aspect of cooperation um, can still be attracted to, to Russian academia just because it offers uh, a prospect of, uh, of sort of broadening your horizon to um, to China. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just add yeah. one note that occurred to me? Uh, it's uh, a curious and uh, sad uh, tendency at the same time. I heard from uh, junior scholars, early career academics uh, who have taught for several years, they have uh, their Russian uh, degrees, who uh, got in touch and asked uh, what I could recommend as a good doctoral program for them. So, <laughs> which means they are willing to uh, start again mm -hmm. uh, from scratch because uh, they uh, feel like uh, they wouldn't be uh, competitive on the uh, European or US job market and they realize that maybe it's time to you know, give it another try mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, just lose a few years of uh, their career. All right, so we're out of time. Um, if our speakers have any sort of concluding remarks. Uh, we would like to give you a minute or, or so. Um, so yes, and um, say Kaisa. something. Kaisa. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I I, I think this this seminar is um, or sort of Evgeny's participation and our very similar answers to to, to the majority of questions really. Uh, really shows how um, how difficult it is <laughs> you know, when it comes to academic freedom in, in Russia. Uh, but um, again, uh, I would not leave it only to, to those who are in a difficult situation or who research academic freedom to find um, ways of supporting exiled scholars. I, I'd really um, like to encourage everyone to, to think about ways of um, nudging and, and advocating for those scholars within your own networks and within your own communities. Uh, thank you so much. I will, I will end with, with, with this message. Uh, I cannot but second uh, Kasia on this uh, invitation. And I uh, would also like to thank everyone for your know, great interest and uh, good questions. Uh, now I know what to maybe still clarify in my paper. Thank you so much for inviting and was great to be here. Thank you for a great discussion. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming in. And um, we also would like to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York for funding uh, our events, including this one. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kasia. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm not sure what I want. <laughs> um, either am I. That's it. Before you go, that was really interesting. What you know, I was thinking you mentioned periodization only at the end, but I was actually thinking, are there were there studies of Soviet period and ways in which people try to um, I mean, have scholars study how, how academic